name is Jules Netherland. I'm the Managing Director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at the Drug Policy Alliance. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Sheila in just a minute to introduce our panelists, but I just wanted to give my warm welcome and thank everyone for tuning in. We have folks from all over the globe, so it's hard for me to even say good evening or because it's good morning for some and good afternoon for others, but we're really um, appreciative that you showed up today to learn about this important topic and this really um, innovative groundbreaking work that the um, folks from the Global Drug Survey have been doing. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Drug Policy Alliance, we are a national organization based in the U.S. that advocates for more progressive drug policies, ones that are rooted in um, science, compassion, health, and human rights, um, basically trying to move our responses away from the criminal legal system uh, into a public health and health framework. My department, Department of Research of Academic Engagement, works to bridge the divide between uh, research and policy in the field of, of drug policy. And one of the many things we do is uh, this series of webinars that are really designed to help build the skills of, of uh, researchers and academics working in the field of drug policy um, so that they can connect with other experts in the field and really um, hone their skills, all with the goal of making sure that academics and researchers have the tools they need to be very policy relevant and to have the uh, most policy impact that they can have uh, so that their research is being used by policymakers in ways that advance uh, progressive drug policy. So I'm, I'm really pleased that my um, colleague Sheila organized this panel and I'm gonna turn it over to her now to, to introduce the, uh, the panelists and um, take it away, Sheila. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We're incredibly excited to host this webinar. Um, we will pre predominantly be hearing from Dr. Monica Barrett, who is a senior research fellow of the Social and Global Studies Center at RMIT University in Australia. And uh, she will also be co-presenting with colleagues, Associate Professor Jason A. Ferris, Program Leader uh, for Substance Use and Mental Health Unit, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland in Australia, and Dr. Larissa Meyer, a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Clinical Phar Pharmacy at the University of California in San Francisco. So there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards, so please feel free to use the chat box and to use the Q&A function uh, to, to pop in your questions uh, as the presentation goes along, and there will be time to, to go over all of them. So without further ado, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm really pleased that we can all be here. Uh, thanks so much for the amazing work you do uh, for the Drug Policy Alliance and the, the goal to engage researchers and get our research, uh, I guess, more relevant to policy is a, a really important one, I think, globally. So, um, Yes, so uh, I'm Monica Barrett and I'm here to present this work from the Global Drug Survey, uh, Global Drug Market Shifts During the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm hoping we can have a discussion uh, at, at the end more around the, the challenges and the opportunities that this current situation uh, where we find ourselves in, in terms of how research can be done on this topic. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators, some of whom are here today, Jason and Larissa, as well as uh, Marie, Caitlin and Adam, um, who've contributed to this work. But there's a huge support team for Global Drug Survey, variety of uh, research partners and non-government organisations that support us, media partners, people who use drugs, who participate, but also who support us. And we'd also like to put a special thanks into Input, who assisted with this survey as well. And you can see some of the logos there of the universities involved. So I, um, I wanted to acknowledge the Aboriginal nations as the first people of Australia uh, and to note that their lands were never ceded. And this is a picture of um, where I'm coming from here in central Victoria. It's Jaja Wurrung country uh, and the Jaja Wurrung are the traditional owners of the lands upon which I live and work. And in the context of COVID-19, I indeed have been both living and working on these lands in central Victoria for the past six months without actually going into any of the cities. Normally I go to Melbourne and many other cities and many other countries around the world, but we've essentially been grounded here for six months. So I've been really acutely aware of um, 
my connection to this country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So the Global Drug Survey, uh, it's actually embargoed until 10 hours from now. So you can check that out at our website. Uh, so as a result, this information is basically all new. So it's really exciting to be able to present it to you at this moment, but um, we're uh, embargoed for another 10 hours. Um, that'll be 4 a.m in New York, uh, but more importantly, 9am in London. So just letting you know that. So in terms of the presentation, I won't spend too long going over the background because there's a bit of data to, to kind of um, get through. Um, but I will briefly speak about drug markets in COVID-19 uh, COVID period, uh, and also what the Global Drug Survey is and what it can and what it can't tell us. And then look at the results of the drug market indicators from the buyer's perspective. So I guess just to note here, we didn't try and talk to people who uh, sell drugs. We were talking to people who either obtain drugs through other means or um, purchase them. So looking at their purchases and their experiences of market constriction or, or, or expansion. And then um, touching on the challenges and opportunities of digital research during COVID-19. And I know some of you uh, in the audience will have had some experience yourselves uh, to share in that regard as well. Okay. So um, I was fortunate enough to um, work with Judith Aldridge in the last um, few months to write a short commentary uh, which was published in International Journal of Drug Policy and it was really looking at how drug crypto markets or darknet markets might respond to COVID-19 and in that process we had to think about the broader question of how might drug markets respond in this era and we had a basic look at would supply uh, decrease, would it increase, would demand decrease, and would demand increase. And some of the um, mechanisms through which we, we thought that this could work, we, we found mechanisms in all directions. And I guess this is what was quite interesting in doing the, the brief literature review that we did. Um, but especially around decreases in supply um, with COVID-19 and our mobility and our social social restrictions that most countries have implemented, uh, that this could affect distribution routes. For us here in Australia, that's quite important because being an island and being quite isolated, we can often, um, uh, we, we know that a lot of our drugs come via air routes. So that can actually have a major impact on uh, supply coming into Australia. That can be different, obviously, in different countries with more porous borders and where things are being manufactured in that country. But the reduced legitimate flow of goods and services, at least in some parts of the pandemic, definitely can have an effect because through legitimate flows of goods is where illegitimate goods are coming through, uh, hidden in that, in that flow. It becomes harder to hide those goods when those legitimate flows are, are not active. Um, harder to meet friends and dealers for exchanges when public places are shut down. This kind of thing can all lead to constrictions in supply. But there were some possible ways where supplies might increase, especially in the context of an economic downturn. If, downturn, if there are less legitimate employment opportunities, there might be more people involved in the distribution of drugs. They might find that they, they need to be more involved in that if less other opportunities for income are present. Looking at demand, Economic downturns and their relationship to drug use, there's actually a lot of different mechanisms through which that it could potentially increase drug use or decrease drug use. Um, and in an economic downturn, one of the most, I guess the one with the most evidence that we had a look at in our review was that for people who are experiencing difficulties due to unemployment, due to lack of income opportunities, that might increase distress and that might lead to additional drug use. Having said that, if you have less income, potentially you may use less drugs. So these are some of the different mechanisms. Uh, an obvious one is decreased demand for drugs that are typically used in leisure settings, such as uh, MDMA and cocaine, when those settings themselves are shut down. 
Um, for some parts of the world, sickness and death from COVID-19 may um, simply reduce demand for drugs if those people are not there to use those drugs as, um, as awful as that may, may be. So, so there's clearly lots of different mechanisms here. And I guess the point is that the nature, the length and the severity of both the pandemic and the responses to the pandemic are going to matter at a, at a level of uh, individual drug markets. So um, there's been some research, I guess a, a few things that I've found recently. I know there's so much that's being done that's not quite yet published around drug market changes during COVID-19. Recently, just last week, there was a report out uh, in part of Australia, Western Australia, which is particularly remote. And uh, Australia has been, I guess, normally we have complete openness with all our borders of our states and territories, but at the moment, many of them are hard borders, meaning people can't go in and can't go out. So that has resulted in a drastic market constriction for methamphetamine in Western Australia with soaring prices, um, very lack of availability, uh, strange concoctions being sold as methamphetamine. So that, that result is just, I guess, maybe an extreme example of how market constriction can occur in this situation. The European Monitoring uh, Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction has put out some early reports using wastewater showing decreased cocaine and MDMA use uh, across Europe. But also they've seen both increased and decreased cannabis use. They noted there were increased cannabis buys on uh, darknet markets that they were monitoring, indicating an increased demand for that substance. The, um, a couple of different studies in Australia, EDRS and ADAPT, and, and these studies are looking at sentinel groups of people who use drugs, and they also noted increased cannabis demand and decreased use of MDMA, cocaine and ketamine, but mainly stable access to drugs amongst these people who were regular users of those drugs. So moving on to Global Drug Survey, which we're here to talk about today. Uh, GDS is the world's largest drug survey in terms of the numbers that we collect per annum. Uh, we have an annual survey running November to December every year. We have a core research team, you can see some of us there. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we have such a wide network of people that we rely on. Um, and I'll, I'll talk through that as we go through in terms of partners that help us to recruit and the wider research network. Network. Uh, we're an independent organisation, so we don't, uh, you know, we, we get funding through creating bespoke data reports. So if there's a particular um, jurisdiction that's interested in a particular area, so most recently uh, I did one for the Victorian government here locally for people who attend festivals and looking at the the dynamics of their drug use at those festivals. Uh, and um, we do partner with universities who win competitive funding, but essentially the independence means we can respond really promptly. So if something like COVID-19 happens quite suddenly, we can decide um, within a few weeks and get something ready to go out to, to really um, track emerging trends with um, a quite rapid response. And importantly, our mission is to promote honest conversations about drug use and to help people to use drugs more safely, regardless of the legal status of the drug. So that's the prism through which we, we work at Global Drug Survey. There are things that we can and we cannot do, and I'll, I won't go too far into this, but we're not trying to calculate prevalence estimates. We are based on a self-selected sample of people who use drugs. And so that these are incredibly important caveats in terms of what we can say from our information. But because we do collect information from, um, you know, over 100,000 people per annum, although the COVID survey was a bit less than that, that does allow us to really segment that population, um, drill quite deeply into it. Uh, so say, look at really novel substances or new changes, um, for example, the use of darknet markets when that was first happening. So um, myself and colleagues wrote a paper a couple of years back um, called Moving On From Representativeness, Testing the Utility of Global Drug Survey. If you're interested in the methods, I definitely recommend having a look at this paper. Um, and I think what we, what we really wanted to note here is that both representative and non-representative samples, uh, you know, they both have their place. We can't sort of say that only one of them is telling the gold standard uh, as they, they 
the biases of both need to be taken into account. And this report by the um, American Association of Public Opinion Research is um, particularly helpful in that regard too. So then COVID-19 happened. Uh, and, you know, for many of us, suddenly everything was closed. And suddenly our lives really shifted and we had to, had to take account of a different way of working. So back at the beginning of April, um, GDS moved into action and we thought we really need to work out what's happening here. So we put together this cross-sectional survey and the idea was to understand the impact of the pandemic on people's lives, thinking about alcohol and other drugs, mental health and relationships. In this talk, I'm just looking at the other drugs and there's a lot more obviously, to say about alcohol, mental health and relationships. So the survey itself was 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, we don't offer any payments. It's a web survey. Uh, the data were collected May to June in 2020, and we were asking people about the last 30 days. So looking at that, this is really looking at, in a way, that the start of the pandemic. So what were people doing in April and May? And now that we're so much further along, you know, there, there's much more to look at in terms of what might now have changed. It was available in multiple languages. The recruitment was through mainstream and alternative media partners, paid and organic social media posts. And halfway through that period, we um, put out some interim findings as a way of um, helping to move recruitment along as well. And just to show you some examples of some of the, uh, the ways that we recruited, this was through Vice, uh, and we also recruited through um, looking, I guess, to recruit festival goers, club goers who would otherwise be going out uh, through these kinds of advertisements, through DJ Mag, etc., through The Guardian. So this is an example of some of the uh, recruitment that we did when we had re reduced, when we had uh, published the interim findings. So being able to kind of say, hey, here's some findings about your country and would you like to uh, be involved? So uh, the period that this, and I should credit Larissa, you can see here, uh, the period that we were recruiting through also included the Black Lives Movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and protests across the world. And as a result, it was important for us to really step back from, from recruitment to give space to that movement. What that also meant that was that we really didn't collect a very large US-based sample um, due to the timing of that movement as well. So um, it, it's one of the, it's also one of the, um, sorry, I'll go back to that, one of the, um, I guess, issues with, with our sample at the moment is that it's predominantly um, people identify as white. So we haven't really um, made that sample as diverse as we certainly could do. Uh, and it's a challenge for us moving forward. In terms of the market indicators that we measured, we looked at um, um, specific drug types used in the last 12 months. Um, has the frequency of use changed? What were the reasons for increased and decreased use? Uh, we looked at the last time you purchased a drug, some information about that, whether the transaction was different, if so, how, if they did not purchase, why not? And also general questions about the markets in their country. Um, we looked at, in this analysis, we looked at those variables uh, in groups. So looked at increased demand, decreased demand, increased supply, decreased supply, price indicators, substitution and stockpiling. We looked at 20 different drug types. These are the drug types we looked at. Uh, four of these were medications, which we also asked whether they were prescribed to you or not or to someone else. So I'm going to skip through this and get back to this at the end because we repeat this at the end and I know um, I am going over time if I don't get through this. So sample demographics, we had 25,000 people. Uh, you can see this is not truly global. Um, and there's a lot of countries we don't cover. But the countries that um, we got the most respondents from were Germany, France, Netherlands, and Brazil. And across the entire sample, our, our age range, we're looking mostly at young adults. Um, we had more um, men than women in our sample. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't have the ethnic diversity that we, we would like to have, and that's something we need to work on. We also don't reach people who are um, homeless or unstably accommodated, and that's something to keep in mind as well. 
In terms of use of the last 12 months of which drugs, this slide is really just to indicate that um, the, the ends, to get a sense of them, that the majority of this sample were using cannabis. Uh, so that's just worth keeping in mind that a lot of the information here is about THC cannabis, uh, but also MDMA and cocaine, and then there's a splattering of different drugs there, ketamine, LSD, and prescription opioids and benzos. In terms of the change in frequency of drug use by country, uh, this is any drug excluding alcohol. And if you look at the total column, that's actually across the whole sample. So um, across all the drug types composite together, there's a over 30% of the sample report only increasing their use of drugs. Uh, less than 25% report only decreasing the use of these of, of drugs across the, across the board, but there's a mixed response uh, for over for around 15% across the board, and this is where they have said they've increased frequency of one drug while decreasing frequency of the other. And the gray the gray line there is no change, and th that's about a third of the global sample said there was absolutely no change in the frequency of drug use. In terms of that that last one um, by by countries. This is for cannabis, sorry. So for cannabis, this was the drug that people reported they had increased the most. Uh, you can see Australia was uh, almost half of us uh, said we had increased uh, use of cannabis. Uh, but there's still a lot of stability there. Uh, so this matches what, what we'd heard from those initial reports um, that I mentioned from other data sources as well. But when we look at MDMA, this was the drug that was most likely to have decreased. Uh, so again, Australia was about 50% saying they had fully decreased that drug. There's also a lot of stability and much less um, people saying they had increased using MDMA. And we would expect that uh, given what we've talked about with the context of use of MDMA changing during COVID-19 restrictions. In terms of uh, change of frequency by any drug, uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is by, so this is we're looking globally now, um, cutting out all countries, just looking global, and we're looking at each drug type. So this goes to what I was talking about before, where you can see that cannabis is most likely to have increased. Um, MDMA and cocaine are similarly most likely to have decreased. And there's some caveats with some of these drugs. We have very low ends. I've included them anyway, just to give you an example of some of the things that we have measured. So looking across the different areas of demand, um, first looking at decreases in demand. So um, the, the chart on the left is for all drug types composite. So total any decreases in demand, and these are potential reasons why you might have uh, used less. So some reasons like I have less contact with the people I use this drug with, etc. There's a third of the global sample that say um, have indicators of decreased demand. And you can see here that MDMA, cocaine and amphetamine were the drugs most likely to be associated with these decreases. Um, issues like, um, I don't feel like using this drug at home was the third, third most common reason um, across the ones that we would expect, less, less occasions to use and less contact with people who would typically use. Doing a similar uh, analysis for increases in demand. So these are reasons why people might have increased the use of that substance. Uh, that across, a across the global sample was 40% of the sample. People who use drugs, 40% of them said that they had decre uh, increased demand. Uh, and some of the reasons for this that were the most common were having more time to use the drug and being more bored. And this was most associated with cannabis as well as benzodiazepines. Looking at the reasons why decreases in supply might have happened or, or aspects of decreases in supply, this was um, less commonly reported in the sample. Less than 20% of the sample reported these decreases. Uh, and interestingly, the decreases were most associated with uh, cannabis and cocaine, and you can see down the line there. So um, the most common reason, I guess, that, that was contributing to the decreases in supply was uh, difficulty in access, but we also had some other difficulties being unable to purchase that drug, being unsuccessful in purchasing, uh, or more difficult to find a, a supplier longer to take, to, longer to, it taking longer to get the drugs than usual. 
There was only one measure associated with an increase in supply and this was really uncommonly chosen. So this was um, a reason for increased use being this drug is now more available. Uh, and so yeah, this is really uncommon. Uh, one, in, one in 20 in the sample reported this. So thinking about price, uh, which is, we looked briefly at that model of uh, how price might respond to decreases or increases in demand and decrease increases in supply. What we were seeing here is that there was very little reports of better value for money and there were, um, you know, some significant reports of worse value for money. Worse value for money was low, was, um, was basically higher price. So um, this was around 14% of the sample reporting higher price, but this was not, not a huge amount of the sample doing so. Uh, and this was most associated with cannabis um, there. We also looked at substitution and stockpiling. Uh, so substitution was really uncommonly reported in the sample. There was very few people saying they were having uh, they had increased the use of one drug because they had not been able to find the drug of their drug of choice. But there was a reasonable proportion of people saying they were stockpiling. They were saying things like they have larger amounts at home than usual, um, or that they bought in bulk or in greater quantities than usual uh, um, during COVID-19. So looking at these market indicators across three drug types for which we have the most data, cannabis, MDMA and cocaine, um, you can see some differences there, I guess reflecting what we mentioned at the start there. The differences being that there's an increased demand for cannabis uh, and a decreased demand for MDMA and cocaine. But in terms of supply, um, yeah, there's not, I guess there's not as much evidence from, from this data around decreased supply. Uh, there's more stability in supply and changes in demand, um, I guess, are more common here. So we also, at the end, asked a general market indicator question. In general, what changes, if any, do you think COVID-19 has had on the illicit drug market in your country? So, uh, and people could say it was more available, less available, higher price, lower price, lower purity, higher purity, and um, diff, um, it was hard to find the range or easier to find the range that they were looking for. Uh, and with that much more general question, we had higher response rates. And I guess you would expect this. People might be drawing on experiences beyond their own. Uh, maybe they know of people in their, in their networks that have, uh, for example, experienced an increased price because we had a third of people in with this general question saying that prices are higher. And that was not reflected as much in their specific uh, um, behaviours in relation to, say, their last purchase. I, I charted the available, decreased availability uh, on the right there by country. And you can see that that was quite dramatically different across countries with Ireland coming up as most likely to say there's de decreased availability and the Netherlands there least likely to say that. So finally, um, we also looked at source and delivery mode um, and we looked at purchases between January and June and I've divided those up January, February, March, April and May, June. There's not a lot of difference to be honest here. Um, there's not a huge difference and I think, you know, that goes to and speaks to the stability of uh, markets through this phase. Uh, there certainly hasn't been a huge shift amongst these people to say a different mode of supply. And finally, um, uh, certainly with my interest in digitally mediated supply, um, I wanted to look at whether people had used different modes of supply for the first time during COVID-19. So I had a look at that and it was very low numbers that said that, so 1.9% or um, just, over two, just under 200 people. Um, and saying that they'd use this mode of supply for the first time. Uh, and there were a few people there that said they had used the dark net for the first time, as well as a number of other types of supply, but this was very minor in the data. 
So just to summarise all of that, I know it's a lot of information at the moment. Uh, in terms of the question I believe we were asking here was, you know, how have drug markets changed in light of COVID-19 and the social and mobility restrictions imposed across many, not many nations? I think there are many storylines, many threads here, um, but one of the things that's come through is the stability of markets for most people. You know, we had um, in most cases a good third to a half in many questions just saying, no, that hasn't changed. Uh, there were signs of constriction in supply for some people, but not for others. And there was definitely diversity in demand. So reduced demand as well as signs of increased demand depending on the drug type involved. So um, I've said revisited, but I didn't go through this at the start. So I wanna look at the cautions in terms of our, our data and how we can manage it. Uh, it's cross-sectional, so our measurement of change is via self-report. So this is about people's perceptions of whether things have increased or decreased for them. It's um, using cohorts with time one and time two um, before and after would obviously be a better way of measuring that. We're also looking at the drug buyer's perspective, not the drug seller's perspective. So that's a really important caveat. Our recruitment methods will differ between countries. So there are cautions in interpreting country comparisons. Some countries have a, a younger, a median age where we're accessing different kinds of people there. So some more sophisticated analysis can be done as we move through this data to, to try and account for some of those differences between samples. So country level a caution is, is useful, uh, but also, uh, we, and we also we can't use uh, purposive or opt-in samples for prevalence estimation as, we, as we've discussed. While we have the name Global Drug Survey, it is aspirational. We don't cover the whole globe and that's important. It's something we need to work through, especially uh, given that our samples are likely to exclude people with un unstable accommodation and lower digital literacy. So we're, we're accessing a particular kind of group here. So in terms of the, the, the thing that I'm hoping we can, we can discuss uh, as we move forward, in terms of the challenges and opportunities that, that this kind of research represents, it's really not easy to recruit samples of people to surveys at the moment in an environment of digital saturation. I think there's so much that's, that's going on that's trying to capture our attention uh, and it can be quite hard to cut through. And, and there were situations for us during this survey where we, we, it would have been insensitive for us to try and cut through, for example, during the Black Lives Matter campaign, um, it, the, the movement there. So, so it was really important that we were aware of that as we worked through it. It's important to develop that kind of trust, I guess, to, to cut through. Um, so we need to triangulate with other samples. That's something we, we need to do, uh, not just with other samples from surveys, but also with other kinds of data sources. So mentioning some here, police seizures, wastewater and, and drug checking data. We don't pay our participants. Uh, there are arguments for and against that. Um, I'm all for um, remuneration, reimbursement of time and expenses for people who use drugs. That's what we do um, here in Australia as a matter of course, but there are real problems with doing that when you're doing a digital survey in relation to data um, or people just saying, well, I'm just gonna keep doing this survey for the money. So um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Joe Palomar's recent article, which was excellent looking through through some of these issues uh, and concerns. So ours is, our survey has always been focused on anonymity. And that's another issue. Um, if you wanna pay people, typically you have to have some kind of information about them. We try and keep our survey strictly anonymous. And that means we can't do proper longitudinal work. So there's many other challenges and opportunities so I'm hoping to discuss with you during this panel. I know I don't have much time left. So I'd like to, Thank you for listening and also bring in the panellists and, uh, and back to Sheila. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Monica. And I'd also uh, like to invite Jason and Larissa to uh, hop on and turn on their videos and uh, audio because um, you may be able to help with some of the questions, but also I would love to invite both of you to comment on uh, the presentations first um, before we open up. If, if there's anything additionally you'd like to um, kind of say or add to the conversation. I know that Jason, you had made a comment in the chat box, but also Larissa. 
Um, I'll just go first. First of all, um, you know, both Lisa and I are very proud of Monica. He's been spending a few long, long days pulling this together because it's uh, one of the first releases for the COVID data, which, as you mentioned, launches tonight. Um, tonight, Australian time. Um, and some of this was a bit exciting for both, I assume, myself, but so some of the first data we've seen come out of COVID-19. And this sort of reflects on that question that I, that, um, I want to think about Joseph Palmer's question that he just raised for Monica about generalizability. Um, we, we're very um, reserved about ever trying to use generalizability as a catchphrase. Uh, we do our best to say that we're not uh, uh, our sample, our reflection of our information doesn't generalise as it does in population studies um, or representative studies. But more importantly, I think Monica alluded to this, um, often and more often than not, our data aligns with locally captured information at the same time. So Monica raised some stuff from the ADAPT trial here in Australia and the EDRS and we see that our data reflects this local information quite well. So two different samples often, the other one's equally non-representative, um, but we find this um, uh, amalgamation of information always seems to overlap and coalesce really well. So that always gives us really good belief that what we have in our sample re reflects this population in general. Great. And um, I only can add a few points uh, for the U.S. perspective, given that we don't have so much data. So I try to make sense of what has come up. So when we look at the increase of any drug, we were seeing that the U.S. was among the countries that showed the highest increase. When, for example, countries like Switzerland and New Zealand, um, most of the people stayed the same. So that also has to do something, of course, with the culture and mental health overall. And uh, the United States has been like suffering like multiple pandemics at the same time and COVID-19 was just one of them. And again, um, the horrible um, ki police killings and brutality um, when George Floyd was killed, Breonna Taylor and so on, that has taken a huge toll on many people's mental health. So all of that together, it's still interesting to see like what are the medications or the, the substitutes that are used the most for self-medication and the highest increases were really seen for THC, as a cannabis containing THC uh, that is also legally available in some of the United, uh, some of the states in America. And um, the other was benzodiazepine. So that's something you would not generally have on the monitor when you talk about illicit drugs, right? But it's something that also when you look at the overdose crisis, we see a lot of um, deaths related to overdoses that also contain stimulants or um, benzodiazepines in addition to just opiates. So that's something to keep in mind. And then um, Monica mentioned that people were stockpiling cannabis. And I think that was especially true in countries where there is no legal market and what happened in, for example, San Francisco, where I'm based, is that people really lined up in front of dispensaries and the dispensaries were then kind of shut down, but the next day they were opened as essential businesses. And that's also something that has helped, like, taking away, this, uh, taking away the stress that some of the people may have felt at the beginning of the pandemic. So that was a huge step and that's, it's especially interesting for all of the countries that still um, keep it as illegal. And then we've also seen that US was basically lowest uh, on the decreased availability. So despite having really high law enforcement efforts in the country and very high drug prices. So for example, when you um, compare ketamine, one of the drugs that we didn't discuss today, um, you can buy it on a dark net or in the Netherlands for $15. And here it's about $100, $120. So there are huge price increases because it's more difficult to actually access the drug. But the overall availability of the drugs during COVID-19 has not changed. So that's also something to keep in mind. And saying this, it has not changed just for the people we reach. Um, generalizability is an issue. We reach, of course, very well-educated and more or less um, people who um, enjoy a certain kind of privilege. And that is also visible with the stability to markets because what we see on the streets right now in San Francisco or elsewhere, we really have to be clear that those people don't have these choices. And there it's oftentimes the case that the drug, if the drug of choice is not available or if it's not affordable, they are moving to other things. And we even have like new synthetic opioids coming up um, in addition to what has been there. 
So again, um, putting this into context, uh, reflecting on who our sample is and um, highlighting and stressing one more time that it's very important to use global drug survey data in addition to other available data to actually make the full picture available of a drug market in a specific country. Thank you so much. Um, and I feel like some of your comments, Larissa, um, may have um, opened us up to some more follow-up questions, which I hope some of the audience members will contribute. But um, I'd love to uh, learn a little bit more about the role that INPUD played in, in the development, in the recruitment, but also um, in their interpretation of the findings. Um, I'd love to hear about just kind of their involvement more broadly. I can go to that question. Um, yeah, so the there was a section that Input helped to develop. They also uh, looked at the full questionnaire and provided feedback on it. But there was a section that they helped to develop around treatment. Uh, so treatment access changes, that kind of thing. And going to Larissa's point about who we reach, and, and what we expected as well with putting in this module about treatment, which we haven't presented to you today, was that we didn't reach many people for whom this was relevant. So, it, you know, for, for those that we did reach, um, my memory of the data was that for some of them, they, and this is literally hundreds rather than thousands or tens of thousands. So people that were receiving, for example, pharmacotherapy, uh, did that change, uh, were there, um, problems or access access issues for those people. So input were particularly uh, involved in developing that module. So uh, yeah, but I guess what we needed to do potentially during that recruitment period was to, to get that right would have been to do some additional work in recruiting the right people. And we did have discussions about potentially going out with, you know, um, tablets and like getting the survey out to people who would be, um, able to provide that that kind of insight um, but that certainly goes beyond um, what we normally do in terms of our recruitment so I think yeah how do we how do we change what we're doing to reach different people I think is really important and I just want to add to that this isn't this isn't inputs first um, engagement with GDS so I think yeah. back in 2015 2016 they did a very extensive module on um, injecting drug use I think one of the most extensive that's been in a uh, drug using survey environment that has a global footprint, um, which captured everything. I do remember quite well from your first injecting experience and the event based activities that were around that. And um, uh, there's a quite a phenomenal um, story of data that sits, it sits in there still today, which has um, led to a number of papers and I think a big report for input as well. Mm. But they haven't yet had a look. So yeah, we, we're really looking forward to getting feedback from all of our partners uh, about how to interpret what's going on and of course, how to do more analysis because there's more to be done there too. Um, I, as long as uh, we don't have any more audience questions, I can continue to to ask questions, but I would like to invite our audience to to, to join in. But um, there's quite a few folks on the line who are researchers themselves who are grappling with, um, you know, what do they do with existing grant monies that have been allocated for research slash um, in this moment, what does a new research proposal look like that can capitalize on the availability of the web, but also you know, accommodate for the fact that there's going to have to be some limitations that they have to acknowledge as well. And I was just wondering, can you talk about some of the lessons you learned in terms of web-based survey development, you know, um, recruitment, uh, response rates, um, you know, question design uh, for, for researchers on the call who are considering or exploring COVID-related questions for web or even in-person surveys? Who Start should go on. first there? <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I guess this this moment, um, certainly the context that I'm working with a university in, in Melbourne where I've got a, a team of people around me, some of whom have never done digital research and have sort of found themselves plunged into it. This suddenly, you know, the ethics approvals have had to be, oh, everything has to suddenly be done using uh, digitally mediated means. You, you can't go and do those 
face-to-face -face interviews that you were expecting to do. So they've then come to me and, and asked questions like that. And I guess it's it's been tricky because that's the work that we've been doing for, for, for a long time now. And I think how to then adapt that is going to depend so much on the population that you're engaging with. And so, yeah, for us, like one of the questions that's come to me from one of my colleagues, they're, they're engaging with people with mental health concerns who they would normally interview either in their home or they would interview them sometimes at a hospital. So they're having to do those by um, phone call or video call and working through that kind of thing. And they're just little things like kind of important things, but small things. So like, how do I do consent if I don't have a signed form? People are asking me questions like that. And for us, we've, we've never had a signed form. We, we've been doing this for a really long time without a signed form because it's anonymous and it's really important that people aren't asked to sign their names regardless of COVID-19. So I think a lot of these things can be worked through if you need to, but for many people who maybe aren't working with illegal behaviour type issues, it, it's kind of a, it, it can be a stretch <laughs> um, to, to consider that this needs to be, um, you know, not a physical paper thing. Um, yeah, so uh, there's there's more to say. Um, Jason, do you want to say some more? I, I probably want to um, just touch on the this duopoly of you either do these um, excellent representative, you've got a sampling frame, you go out, you make sure you get a hundred percent response rate. Um, you get this data that which you can say is the best reflection and representation of the population. Here's our incidence and prevalence. And you have all these amazing language um, uh, tag words that can get thrown out. Um, but people sort of forget that to achieve that often costs within millions of dollars, right? Mm. Um, and if you, that's, that's at the top end of actually achieving full 100% representation as if this was set up in a lab. The whole idea of um, these representative sampling frameworks is to believe that you get 100% of your population who you put a survey in front of answer the survey. Now, we know that over the years, decades now, that response rates on these representative samples have been massively dropping. Um, the last uh, one in Australia, the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, they report their response rate at just on 50% and their, um, what's my OR rate? My um, uh, response rate. Uh, the other one, which is an adjusted rate, fits about 35 to 40%, which if you just take that number, that's one in three people who the samplers got to and said yes. So two in three people said no. Right. So some of you are saying, well, this is rep representative and that, you know, we, we have great statisticians who can do post weight adjustments and all this fantastic work. But the beginning statement is they didn't get their rep representative sample at 100 percent. When you go down to these priority populations, drug use being one of those fantastic ones, homelessness, rough sleeping, GLBTIQ communities, uh, wherever you go to these priority, more diverse uh, people with uh, a response, mental health, as Monica was just right, with, with, uh, that live within a categorization that may not be willing to talk to these uh, prevalent studies, um, suddenly they're not represented at all. And so the Global Drug Survey and many of these other studies is the only way to get them. Now, when we sort of get hammered by this representation and as um, Joseph was asking this generalizability, we, we suddenly realise that um, if you want both, someone needs to pay tens of millions of dollars for this very small community of people to be representative. And then you've got to go through a whole lot of hard work to do that. And, and no one, no government wants to pay that, right? And so mm -hmm. we either don't have these questions being answered or we come up with these really diverse and targeted mechanisms to get the, this data. And then we've got to try to improve that and talk about that. And so we do our triangulation to make sure that what we see in one looks the same in the other. And that gives us a bit more sense that we're doing a good job. And that paper that Monica referred to, the 2016, if you took away the word prevalence and just went, let's compare the last 12 months, we had really good 
match samples across, you know, cannabis, alcohol, um, I think methamphetamine as well, the, the, this traffic behaviour that compared the GDS to representative data from four countries, I believe. Is that correct, Mom? Was it four or three countries? I think it was three. Yeah, three countries. In Australia. Yeah. Um, and so that gave us a lot of good hope that what the GDS says and captures is, is, is real. Maybe I've one. seen three different questions here. Yeah, <laughs> Who are you going to answer? A few have popped in, but I see, Larissa, you turned your mic on. Did you want to hop in or are you, can you wait for me to add the other questions? What would you I like? I can wait. Okay. Um, so we got one quick question. Was fentanyl, did fentanyl come in? Was it emerging? Was there a question for it? Any sort yes, of so I can go to that question. We did ask about illicitly manufactured fentanyl and fentanyl analogues. That was the question we asked. Uh, and so that was one of the 20 different drug types where we asked the full set of questions, but it was the drug type we had the least number of people respond to. Now, of course, that that's them knowing that they are using fentanyl and, and saying, yes, I self-report that I have used this drug. And of course, what you know, what we're most interested in is whether fentanyl is appearing in opiates, opioid supplies. So, so that's more of a, did you know you were using it? And if so, has it increased? And we only had 68 people respond. So really not enough to, to go on. Um, but yes, obviously one of the things you can't do in a web survey is something that you could do in a drug checking uh, service, which is actually analyze the drugs, find that there's a drug in there that, that wasn't sure. there. So, so yeah, we, we, we can get at that a little bit more in a survey, which I've done some of my other work that's non-GDS, where you're actually asking people, well, did you use um, you know, heroin or, or another drug? And was, did it feel different? Did, did this happen? But again, that that's really hard. You really need to have a drug checking or to do that Absolutely. work, I think. And there's been yeah. some mixed research on whether people have been able to accurately, you know. Um, it's I really hard. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so right. We, we have just a few minutes left and I want to squeeze in both questions if possible. So um, can you quickly talk about the platforms that you used for recruitment? How did you choose the platforms that you did use? It's an excellent question. So the main thing that we do to recruit is through media partners. So we have a, an array of partners that just, I mean, Vice is a great example. You know, the, the audience that vice.com reaches is really in scope for us. So we have an agreement with them. We talk to them beforehand about what we want to do. They then put out a call for recruitment just as a normal article. And then in exchange for that, we then feed them back information like we have on this survey that's just about to be released, where they would then get exclusive access to that, to, to more information than just any, um, any person from the media. And then that way they, it's sort of a, a relationship then builds. Some of the partners, um, uh, you know, contribute funds, uh, others, uh, there's just a, a relationship there with no funds. Uh, and so that's the main way. And then I guess on top of that, then using social media channels to directly recruit. So there was a Facebook ad that you saw in the presentation. So that's been a way, I guess, to boost participation where we've have where we've had the funding to actually put in for that. Uh, and so Facebook and Instagram have been platforms that we've utilised there as well as uh, Twitter and, and other platforms. But, you know, I think there's, there's more we could do there. But I guess, yeah, the main one, you know, each country, like I know Germany has, you know, an amazing um, media partner. You know, there's a media partner in New Zealand that's really active. There's media partners in, in Brazil. So, it, and, you know, I think in the Netherlands, it was just Vice. Vice just got, you know, went, went really large in the Netherlands for, for this, this particular one. So it, it moves around a bit. Great. And so we have one last question uh, before we wrap up. So how might your work help us redefine what is meant by survey? I mean, you focus in representativeness or generalizability, but there seems to be a different criteria for evaluating your work. Um, so how would you mm. offer people a perspective in understanding your findings and what those mean? Yeah, that's a great question, Annette, and it's lovely that you, you, you hear, Annette, to, to um, I'll have to talk with you after in, in more detail about that depth. 
Uh, yeah, so I think what it is, is we're, we're using the survey methodology and we're, we're coming at it with some, some differences. We're coming at it saying, well, we, we want to hear what people have to say. We want to give people a voice. Um, we want people to be able to um, provide that, uh, you know, their input. And yet we're doing it through this quantitative method. And so I think sometimes that can can be hard because yeah I feel like um, that the number having the larger numbers makes so much possible for us but yet when we're appealing to people in a way we're appealing to to something that I don't know it's kind of like if you were doing a qualitative study and you were asking to do depth interviews I think this is the way that we're appealing to people and so maybe that's part of the the, the disjuncture there I don't know, maybe Larissa can comment a little bit on that one as yeah. well. I mean, um, a survey is basically just like asking people questions, right? Because there is, uh, there are two reasons we want to collect data and be able to like say something about their drug use because uh, we don't have this data again in the representative studies because many people in many countries, especially illicit drug use, is still stigmatized and often criminalized. So many people cannot openly talk about it. So with our form and the trust that we have through the participants, we really reach out to sometimes also smaller samples or people who are using specifically a new psychoactive substance that is never ever reported in other survey and this is really a clear strength of global drug survey we always like um back to the other question egg on a bit with the length of the survey so um for a good survey definitely needs to be short and user friendly as much as you can we really appreciate all the people who participate in our service all the time and take up all the time we know it takes long um, but some of the questions need to be in depth and also when we develop them together with people who use drugs, it's really important to get closer to the issue and at least for that subsample who decides to take that special module, have that additional um, information available. And importantly, we have uh, modules on policing and help seeking, for example, so we can really look at policies in the countries and look whether um, the certain policies in a specific country are um, into um, interfering with the help seeking behavior and that's what we've shown in one of the papers that uh, if there is a more liberal policy, uh, people are more likely to seek help. And I think that's very important. And if we collect data, that's one thing we do. We can talk about the interpretation of the data. But the much bigger piece is also that we're contributing to the dialogue nationally and internationally to talk about drugs, to talk about something that is oftentimes still stigmatized when we all know that is nothing that people should be criminalized for. Those are lovely last words, Larissa, honestly. Uh, I don't know how else better to wrap up this uh, presentation, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Monica, Larissa, and Jason for speaking with us today. Um, and we, uh, for those of you who attended our event, we'd love to invite you to join us for our next uh, book talk. Uh, at the end of the month, we are thrilled to have, um, I, I will put up this, the flyer real quick. Um, we are thrilled to have uh, Maya Shenwar and Victoria Law speak about their new critically acclaimed book, Prison by Any Other Name, uh, The Harmful Consequences of Popular Reforms. Uh, it's Tuesday, uh, the 29th, 4.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, and uh, a real privilege for us to be uh, hosting such esteemed speakers to come talk to us. And so on that note, thank you so much for this preliminary glimpse on this research. Um, we, hold we hope people will keep their, their, um, keep their comments to themselves and, and wait until the official release, but we are so thrilled that we got a, a sneak peek today. So thank you all for joining us.